Hello, I'm Alison Kempenar from Lexus PSL Private Client, and I'm joined here today by Emily Gravener Taylor, uh, an associate at Harbottle and Lewis. And Emily has come in uh, today to talk to us about the EU uh, succession regulation, otherwise known as Brussels 4, uh, which we know is a topic uh, that has been troubling uh, many of our listeners. Uh, so thank you very much for coming in today, Emily. Um, perhaps you could just start by setting out a bit of uh, background about the regulation. Yes, of course. So the laws established under the EU haven't historically applied to any issues surrounding succession for member states in particular. Until recently, member states had to apply their own private laws um, for matters of succession. Just to briefly run through an example for you as to the sort of issues that might have previously arisen. If, for example, you had a UK resident who had a holiday home in the south of France, but for example, was a Swiss national, you would have been advised that a UK will was needed for all your UK assets. Um, the situation with the French property would have been particularly difficult and more complicated because of something called a forced airship regime, which they have in France. English law would have dictated that in the case of French property, the lex situs, meaning the law where any assets are situated, would have governed any succession. And as a result, the clients may have been forced to abide by French law upon um, their death. However, because the client was a Swiss national, Swiss law would have said that it applied to the whole of the estate where their own forced heirship regime would have come into effect. So as you can see, there were potentially a huge range of issues and very complex situations um, which would have made effective succession planning particularly difficult as the way that assets were treated on death was so uncertain. That's obviously all now changed with the EU succession regulation and with the exception of the UK, Ireland and Denmark from the 17th of August 2015, the succession regulation came into effect and it means that all member states who have signed up for it are now bound. The regulation essentially ensures that succession is now treated more coherently, um, firstly by allowing one single court to apply the rules of succession um, across their um, respective areas. It gives certainty to the proceedings um, for UK EU citizens and secondly it gives testators the opportunity to choose the law of the succession that will govern their will. Yes, I see. That's all very clear. And, and what are the sort of key, um, key provisions of the regulation? So there are a few key provisions in the regulation. I'll just run through what I think are the four main ones briefly now. The first is a change in jurisdiction. The courts of a member state in which the deceased had his or her habitual residence at the time of death will have jurisdiction to rule on the succession as a whole. This means that no succession issues should be referred back to the courts of any other member state. It's a principle known as renvoi, which has effectively been abolished for member states, but it's important to note that that's not necessarily the case for those who haven't signed up to the regulation. The second general principle is that the law applicable to the succession as a whole shall be the law of the state in which the individual had his or her habitual residence at the time of death. The third is that the regulation allows anyone to actually change that law under a choice of law provision which can be contained in their will. That's provided they choose the law of the state in which they had nationality um, at the time in which they make the election or at the time of their death. You don't have to be an EU national um, in the member state to make that choice of law. So for example, if you're an Australian national living in France, with assets in that jurisdiction. You can elect for Australian law to apply to your whole will and all of the assets in the EU, including those in France, will be included. The fourth provision is that the regulation creates a mechanism for something called a European Certificate of Succession. The use of the certificate isn't mandatory and it doesn't take the place of documents which are already used for similar purposes in certain jurisdictions. But once a certificate has been issued, it has effect in the member state of origin, as well as any other member state. So that means that the idea behind this, again, is that personal representatives, heirs and legatees shouldn't be faced with evidential problems when they're trying to stake a claim to an estate or administer it. So the certificate's useful in a way to um, prove your right or power to administer an estate. 
Yes, I see. And would you mind saying a bit more um, by, about what is meant by the concept of habitual residence? Yes, of course. Habitual residence essentially is a concept which um, we need to become a bit more comfortable with as um, UK nationals. In the UK, we're more used to this idea of domicile and habitual residence are slightly different. It's a meaning that's developed through EU case law and is more akin to the concept of ordinary residence, which was until recently quite well known amongst private client practitioners who were specialising in, uh, with non-domiciled individuals. Habitual residence isn't defined in the regulation, which is slightly um, difficult, but put simply, it's where the deceased was living on the date of their death and had established a permanent or fixed area of interest. This can, however, and quite importantly, be overridden if it was clear that the deceased was manifestly more connected to another jurisdiction. So, for example, if someone had moved abroad temporarily for work, then that wouldn't apply. This mainly actually was used in order to ensure that people didn't move to other jurisdictions just before their death in order to take themselves out of any forced airship regimes in their home country, though. I see. And how, how does the um, regulation affect the UK specifically? So, to date, the um, regulation has been signed up to by 25 member states, the exception being the UK, Ireland and Denmark, who have opted out of signing into it. The reason why the UK chose not to sign up to the regulation was because the government felt it would require the UK to apply clawback provisions in the law of other member states, which would create far too much uncertainty in relation to things like lifetime gifts to trusts and charitable organisations. The implication of this is obviously quite significant as it adds an extra degree of complexity to the treatment of UK assets, um, as the UK isn't a signatory in view of the regulation. There's been a considerable degree of discussion amongst the private client, client community um, in the UK and elsewhere about the status of the UK, Ireland and Denmark and how it will be treated. Whilst it appears self-evident from the fact that these three countries haven't signed up that they will be treated as third states for the purposes of the regulation and the majority of the regulation treats them as such, there's some degree of ambiguity which has crept in by virtue of the fact that other references in the, re the legislation seem to imply that the three countries might be treated as a member state. The effect of these is quite different and as such it's caused a degree of confusion. However, our view is that the three countries are very likely to be treated as third states and not member states and that the confusion actually only results because of a drafting error. Until this is actually clarified, it's important to note that there should be a degree of caution when approaching the regulation though. Yes, I see. And so, um, to take it to a specific example, uh, how would this affect an individual who's habitually resident in the UK, uh, who's got assets in the UK, uh, but also has assets in another EU member state, uh, which has forced airship rules? So in very practical terms, the easiest solution would be to elect the law of the nationality to apply. This removes the problem entirely as the regulation is very clear. That the law of the state will then apply regardless of whether or not the state chosen is a member state or that of a third state under the regulation. So for a client who has English nationality or a nationality which allows them a sufficient degree of testamentary freedom to do what they want with their estate, an election as to the law of nationality is probably the best way to go. However, for those individuals who are habitually resident in the UK, Ireland or Denmark and who don't have an appropriate nationality to elect into, caution may be advisable as they may wish to continue to have multiple wills in EU jurisdictions where they have assets until that point is cleared up. I also mentioned earlier the concept of renvoi and that's when this comes into play. When the applicable law to the estate of the deceased who hasn't made an election is that in their will is that of a third state, such as the UK. The private international laws of that third state are still relevant insofar as they make a reference to the law of a member state or the law of the third state, which would apply its own domestic law. Also to take into consideration is the fact that an election of law, again, will ensure that renvoi doesn't apply.
Yes, I see. Well, thank you very much for coming in today, Emily, to talk to us about those points. Um, that really does uh, clarify quite a lot of the technical and also uh, practical points that I know a lot of our listeners um, have been grappling with. So thank you very much. Pleasure.